I'm thrilled that we have Louis Rosenberg joining us for this conversation because he's a true pioneer in virtual reality augmented intelligence back in the early 1990s at Stanford, working then at NASA and for US Air Force. He developed one of the first augmented reality platforms. So Louis, we are excited to have you. And being that this week, Apple launched their augmented reality glasses and it's all over the news. Would love to get to know your thoughts about that, not just as a consumer product, but also how you visualize this augmented reality impacting how we relate with each other in our organizations and in the community. Yeah, so um, you know, Apple had their big announcement. They, they announced a, a, a product called the Vision Pro. I, I think the best way to think of it is it's, they didn't really announce a product, but they really announced an entirely new way of computing. And, and so they, you know, their device, as you probably heard, is expensive. It's $3,500, uh, but it's remarkable. Um, by that, I mean, you know, I've, I've been involved in, in, you know, in the field of virtual reality and augmented reality, you know, from, from the beginning. And, and this is the highest quality device that's, that's ever been produced. Um, the technology is, is the highest quality, the everything about everything about it from, from the way it looks and feels to its fidelity is intended to, to enable, uh, augmented reality experiences of you know that are really convincing and really compelling, not because they expect everybody or very many people to spend thirty five hundred dollars on a device, but because they they want to show the world that the future of computing is immersive, and uh, and over the next you know five to eight years we will see every really every major major manufacturer going in there in that direction with the idea that. Um, that information doesn't need to be on our flat screens. Information can be spatially placed all around us in a natural environment, and we no longer have these boundaries between the real world and the digital world. And um, and you know, Apple's device is is if you've seen pictures of it, it's kind of large. It it looks uh, like a scuba mask uh, that size. Um, I know that their vision for the future is not that that that's the size that it will stay. Uh, I think five years from now, it, people will be wearing uh, just regular glasses, style devices uh, that, that look like stylish glasses and put content in, into our world. And um, and it will it will take our eyes off these little screens that we that we um, stare down at all day. and. Um, and, and so, you know, my view, and, and I've been writing this for, for, for uh, many years, is that augmented reality is really the technology that will replace the mobile phone. Uh, the mobile phone is, you know, it is now the technology that we use to access our digital lives most, most often. We keep it with us from the time we wake up to the time we go to sleep. We check it, you know, way too often all day. Uh, if, uh, you know, you, you hear countless stories of people going, you know, going to a restaurant with their family and, and suddenly they all realize they're all staring down at their phones. And, and so it is, you know, it's convenient. You know, the mobile phone is convenient because it gives us access to our digital life, but it's not convenient that we're all staring down at, at screens and, and little screens we carry around. And the vision of augmented reality is to, to get rid of that. And the information is just all around us and it allows us to keep our head raised and and focus on the world focus on the other people in our world and but still have access to to you know magical content informational content educational content and and it will be everywhere and so apple's launch of this device is really to put it in, in the hands of developers uh, that's who's going to spend the thirty five hundred dollars uh, so that they can start creating the magical content that everybody else will access and um yeah and so that's uh, you know, I see it as, you know, it, then Apple's not the first to do this, but but they are the they are going to create the space. Uh, it's just like they're uh, they weren't the first to create uh, a media player, but um, you know, the iPod 
created that space. They, they weren't first to create a uh, a mobile, you know, a smartphone, but the iPhone created the space, and that's that's what happened uh, this week with their Vision Pro. Uh, Lewis, I uh, had a conversation actually for my podcast with Stephen Sasson who invented the digital camera back in Kodak and then a lot of the technologies that came after it. And part of what he mentioned is at the beginning, it was such a big clunky piece of equipment that a lot of executives would look at it and laugh. And they're like, eh, no one's going to carry this big thing around to take low quality pictures when they can have high quality pictures on film with smaller cameras, not understanding where really quickly that digital photography was going to go. So part of what I hear from you is that Apple is doing this for developers and this thing is going to shrink the smaller and augment our world. Now, I would love for you to spend a little time on that. Uh, there, there's been a lot of conversations around virtual reality, metaverse, augmented reality. I know you're a big advocate for the fact that we are going to live in an augmented world. Can you explain those terms and then right. what you see about our lives in the near future? Sure, sure. So um, as you mentioned, you know, I, I, I got involved in this space uh, you know, over 30 years ago. And my, the first work I did was in you know, quote, virtual reality uh, in, in virtual reality labs at, at Stanford and NASA starting in 1991. And, um, and, and what virtual reality is, is completely simulated world. You, you, you uh, wearing a headset, everything is completely simulated. Uh, you know, back then, the, the, you know, the graphics were not nearly as amazing as they are today, but you could, you could see the potential of simulating your world. And, and for me personally, uh, as somebody who had to spend a lot of time writing software and, and doing research on, 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 on these virtual reality headsets, the thing that struck me immediately was that it, I actually felt uncomfortable being cut off from my surrounding. Like I wanted the power of virtual, of, of virtual reality, virtual worlds, but it's, you don't, it doesn't feel natural if you also can't see your desk and other things around you. Uh, and, and what I found was that for a short period of time, you feel comfortable being completely immersed Similar to like when you go to watch a movie, you feel comfortable spending you know a couple hours, but um, but when when I was you know doing that research at NASA, I felt like what I really wanted to do was to take this you know this ability but put it into the real world, and um, and I was fortunate enough to you know to pitch the the U.S. Air Force to say, hey, you know, can we can we put these virtual objects into the real world, and and they. They funded me to, to build a system. Uh, it was called the Virtual Fixtures Platform at, at Wright Patterson Air Force Base in in '92. And um, again, technology was simple back then. You talk about things getting smaller and bigger. The, the system that you know that first system that I built that allowed people to reach out and interact with um, with virtual and real environments. It cost almost a million dollars. It took up about <laughs> about half a room. Um, it was massive. It, it, the, the the actual headset had to hang from the ceiling. You couldn't you couldn't actually wear it. It had to hang from the ceiling, um, and so. It, uh, but the people who came in and tried it were very like they would come in, they would try it, and and they I could tell even back then that you know if this could become something that was a consumer technology, people would like it. Um, it felt like, I mean, at that point, honestly, I felt like it was it would take ten years to get to, to consumer level product. It's taken, you know, over thirty, um, and you know, and it's been steadily shrunk and made better and shrunk. And, and what Apple did was, you know, is create a headset that is small enough that people will feel comfortable wearing. Right? It's it's small. It's lightweight. Uh, it's not the smallest device that's been created. But their goal was uh, not not to give up on any of the fidelity, like because they're because they want to they so they made the device of the smallest size they could with the highest fidelity possible, and they did one feature that's worth mentioning that is really su so surprising and so interesting, and, and that is so there's two ways of doing augmented reality. One is you create glasses that you can actually see through. 
and the and the screens are actually transparent. That's it's very difficult. There's a lot of companies working on that, um, including big companies like Meta and and Google and uh, Qualcomm and Samsung. They're all working on that. You know, glasses you can see through, uh, but you lose fidelity, and it's um, and it's very hard to have a, a bright image. And, and, and but it will happen. Uh, the the alternate way to do it is to wear an enclosed headset that has cameras on it and the cameras capture the real world and then um, combine it. And so you see an image where you can see the real world combined and in an enclosed headset. The problem with the enclosed headsets, and you've probably seen, seen this, is that people just look creepy wearing, <laughs> like you're wearing a headset, you can't see their eyes, you can't see their facial expressions. They look, they look creepy. It's to that's totally fine if, if they're a gamer sitting alone and nobody else is in their house, right? And that's how most of these headsets have been used up until now. Apple's goal was to create a device that people would use in an office setting with other people. And so what they did was they made an enclosed headset, but they put a screen on the front hidden behind a piece of glass that actually simulates your eyes. And so when you look at somebody wearing this headset, um, they've modeled your eyes and it looks like you can see them. And it, and it, uh, and so it, 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 they're, they've made this, they've made it transparent even though it's it's virtually transparent, and it changes everything. It now it now makes this device socially acceptable, as opposed to uh, you know looking at somebody who looks half android, you know wearing wearing a thing. And uh, and I think that that of anything they've done, I think that's their biggest innovation because they appreciate that this can't just be for gamers. It has to be for everyone, and they they've made a device that uh, that I think. Um, People will people will get excited about it's. I mean, it's the one big barrier is it's very expensive. But again, that's not their concern right now. And those price points, even when they introduced the iPhone, it was very expensive. And those price points come down. I wrote down a couple of comments uh, for anyone that follows or knows Scott Galloway. He had mentioned that Apple's headset will be one of the biggest tech failures in history. And just yesterday, after experiencing it, he tweeted. Um, uh, that you remain present in your space and available to others. It just feels so right, so intuitive. This is definitely the next big thing. So that's Scott Galloway <laughs> and Ben Thompson, who writes Strategery. Uh, it's a great blog on strategy and organizations. He says, it's far better than I expected and I had high expectations. So this is uh, something that is hitting my what I would love to get your thoughts on before then moving to AI, because we can spend hours with you on any one of these topics, Lewis. How do you see this impacting how we relate in organizations and how organizations work? So there's been a lot of conversations around uh, Accenture has tested their end floor, which is a metaverse version of uh, a floor where people can meet and do training. How do you visualize work changing as a result of this augmentation uh, and augmented reality? Yeah, so uh, so I think that what Accenture did with their nth floor and, and also what Meta has done with Horizon World is uh, is to is make this assumption that, that people wanna to get together in virtual worlds as avatars and uh, as, a, as an alternative to video conferencing, right? As a, and um, and I've it's, I've I, I've written about kind of often is that I think that they un, the the idea that people want to get into these worlds that look cartoonish and very cartoonish for business meetings is just it just never made sense right and and um, I'm surprised that Accenture went that direction you know, Meta you know, they're they're I I can. Under, like they're just obsessed with the technology and that maybe they, they not as much the, the people issues. Um, but obviously Horizon World's a failure and, and floor doesn't really get used. And, and, and Accenture's not the only one who, uh, who, who went in this direction. I mean, uh, what Apple has done is completely different. They're saying, you know what? Yes, people wanna get together in, in spatial places, in immersive places, but let's, we're not going to have those people be cartoons. We're going to have those people be photorealistic. And if they're wearing a headset, um, I can see somebody else and see them 
photorealistic and and um but if they're anybody else who's just connecting from a computer they will appear uh as a video conference image but placed in their environment and so instead of you know in, instead of us having you know in zoom all these little square you know these little windows if we were wearing these headsets we would we would see everybody you know spatially arranged and but but real people not cartoons <laughs> and um and i think that that's you know apple's right <laughs> like like that is the future of teleconferencing that's the future of virtual meeting that's the future of how people will uh, will interact um remotely uh and and i and i think this age this vision at least of we're all going to get together as you know, cartoonish avatars i think i think that that was that will die very quickly <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then I, I, uh, I totally agree with you. I've experienced some of those metaverse interactions for a brief period of time or for gaming might be fine, but this is really augmenting our world. So we are interacting tactily and otherwise with the world around us, but it is being augmented with the information we need or maybe the, the people we need in that environment. Now, uh, I didn't mention in the opening that you also have 300 plus patents to your name, Lewis. So you're constantly investigating the space and you have an outstanding TED Talk that I would encourage everyone to watch. In the TED Talk, you start uh, and you scared the bejesus out of me watching your TED Talk where you said we have an alien force coming toward us and we better act. What is that alien force that more people I think in the community and uh, are having conversations around? And how do you think we need to react to that alien force that's uh, potentially about to take over? Yeah, so um, th that TED talks back from 2017. Um, and you know, it is, you know, I, I start off talking about how, you know, a, a, an alien, you know, a, an alien creature is coming to earth <laughs> and we're not prepared. And, and I express that that alien creature is, is artificial intelligence and that it will, you know, it'll be born in labs here on earth, but it will think and, and, um, and function completely different than, than our brains. Uh, and so, uh, the, and the reason I use that metaphor and an example is that we, it will be very easy for us to be lured into trusting AI systems because we are making these AI systems very, very good at pretending to be human. I mean, already, even just with chat GPT, which is, is not a sentient AI and, um, and it's just text-based, text-based people feel like they're now communicating with something that's very human. It doesn't think like us, it's, it's not conscious, it's not sentient, it's just very good at pretending to do those things. And we are, are good at believing that. Now, ChatGPT is just the first step. We, we, you know, within you know, this year, I'm sure you will start uh, talking verbally uh, to, you know, to basically the same large language models, but now, now having verbal conversations. And, and very soon after that, there will be you know, photorealistic uh, representations that we talk to. Like it will, it will look like we're talking to a person, but we're talking to ChatGPT or uh, from or a large language model from another company. It will, it will look human. It will have human expressions. Uh, we will interact with it very naturally, um, but it's not human. It doesn't think like a human, and. Um, and it's potentially very dangerous and, and it's dangerous and, and there's there's two different levels of danger the, the danger that gets the most press is uh you know people worried that, oh these zais are going to become self-aware and sentient and want to take over the world and, and and i do think that's a long-term risk I, I don't i i my you know my perspective is that there's much there's equally large dangers in the near term because you don't need a sentient ai to do bad things you just need a really powerful AI and sentient humans who control it <laughs> and do bad things. And, um, and that's really where we're headed. Uh, and, and we're headed that way because um, 
we're entering this age of what I would call conversational computing, where we, we're talking to our computers, we're, we're talking to our search engines, we're talking, like right now, when we go to an, a website, we're getting, you know, uh, information that's very just uh, text and, and, and images. Very soon, you'll go to a website and there'll be a virtual representative, right? You'll be, you know, every, every website will have an, uh, an artificial agent, uh, uh, a spokesperson, that is powered by ChatGPT or, or another large language model, and you will engage the website. And you will say, you know, hey, I'm interested in uh, in a new car, and uh, and you'll just have a conversation about it. And um, and the thing that that is very worrisome to me is that once you're engaging in AI conversationally, it's very easy for for that system to to uh, to work to try to persuade you to work to try to influence you. And I do believe that they will be highly persuasive and um, to the point where it's, it's not really marketing anymore, it's, it's manipulation. And, uh, and so I um, speak a lot with, with regulators and policymakers to say, hey, you know, we're not prepared for this type of uh, advertising or this type of influence. Like right now, advertising and influence are, and, and you know, on social media, advertising influence is is very powerful, uh, but it's just passing documents around, right? Like a document will pop up, and and that's called targeted advertising. Um, but if you talk to a salesperson, any salesperson, and you, and you say, you know, what's what's the best way to influence somebody? They will not say, oh, hand them a document. <laughs> they, they will not say, have them watch a video. What what they will say is, oh, engage them in conversation. Uh, it, give them a pitch, hear their reaction to that pitch, hear their concerns, work to overcome their concerns. And, and, and that's what AI will be able to do. That's, that's what's going to, that's going to be advertising. <laughs> and, and it doesn't have to just be to sell you a car or sell you a pair of pants. It could be the way that misinformation and disinformation and propaganda gets deployed. And, uh, you know, the regulations that we have in place are really about, you know, about advertising on, you know, social media and, and radio and television, not interactive forms of media that are about to be unleashed and powered by AI. And, um, and, and to me, that's the near-term danger long before we get to the sentient, the sentient AI that could uh, have its own will <laughs> uh, there, there are real concerns, Lewis, and I know you write a lot about it, and uh, uh, both on LinkedIn, the uh, Big Idea, and uh, VentureBeat. There are lots of different articles, and I would urge everyone to uh, read some of that content on some of the concerns and what you are advocating for with respect to AI. Now, being that the uh, folks at uh, Leadership Greater Washington are involved in running for-profit, non-profit, uh, and government organizations. Would love to get some of your thoughts with respect to where the application of AI for organizations is headed in your view. So what is the positive potential on the organizational side? We do need to be mindful on the societal side and have those conversations would love to get some of the organizational applications from your perspective. Yeah, so, I mean, these new AI tools, these generative AI tools and large language tools, I, I, do, I do see it as a, really a revolution. What we, you know, we've, we've had the mobile computing revolution, we've had the, uh, the internet revolution. This is an AI revolution because we now have these tools that can create really human quality content for us. And so, uh, so these, you know, these AI systems can create uh, uh, artwork and, and articles and uh, scientific papers and, and videos. And, uh, and so all organizations are gonna start using that to create content. And I think it is potentially a big, uh, you know, a big efficiency savings, uh, but it's all, there's also dangers there because these, these tools are not perfect. They, they make errors. And yet, you, you know, people are, are, are tend to want to um, trust it because it's an AI that's producing it. And so you have you have these systems that make can make ridiculous errors, um, and yet they, you know, we're not 
cautious enough. So I think all businesses, you know, if they can properly use the technologies, use it as you know as for guidance, but not just take take what they they create and, and put it out there. I think there will be big efficiencies. Um, and the the place where I get really worried about the use of AI is when it's used to replace people, especially in decision making. And, and there's a lot of that that's happening. Uh, there, you know, there's a lot of organizations that are using AI to uh, to guide really important decisions, hiring decisions, loan decisions, you know, granting loans, uh, sentencing decisions by by judges are being <laughs> guided by AI, parole decisions, and it's it's to me it's terrifying because these the guidance that's coming out is is based just on you know statistical data that's processed that data already has biases built into it uh you know existing biases that you know whatever existing biases exist in in how we grant loans get perpetuated now by this ai technology and but but worst of all this ai based decision making doesn't take advantage of of human values and emotions and intuition uh, and and um, and for so many decisions, whether you're designing a new product or you're deciding on you know whether to grant somebody parole, uh, the, the human part of it is so important, and, and that's really the motivation of why you know why we founded Unanimous AI nine years ago. Nine years ago, to me, it was really clear that AI was on a pathway to replace people, to take people out of the loop, to to um, to automate decision making. Uh, to, to automate forecasting, and uh, and that was my that was really the inspiration to say, well, there's got to be a way that we could use AI not to replace people, but to connect people together and make allow people to to make better decisions and better forecasts, but keep all of the human values and, and intuition in you know as part of it, and uh, and like a lot of technologies, what we did was we looked to Mother Nature. And, and it turns out that nature has has been wrestling with this issue for hundreds of millions of years. Where there's you know, what if you have a large population and you want to harness their their intelligence and amplify it? And it turns out biologists have uh, have been studying this for you know for almost a hundred years, um, and, and it's referred to as as swarm intelligence. And it's the reason why birds flock and fish school and bees swarm. They are smarter together than than alone, and and so if you look at say a school of fish, is to me is the most visual example. A school of fish could be thousands of individuals. Nobody's in charge, right? There's there's no leader. Um, each of those fish has a slightly different view of their world, uh, slightly different experiences, slightly different temperament, um, and somehow they all work together and they can navigate the ocean as a single organism, as a super organism. They they they're making, you know, hundreds and hundreds of decisions every day as a as a school of fish. They can navigate their ocean, and they've been a success, successful species for you know for hundreds of millions of years because this works. And so the the motivation for for founding Unanimous AI was to say, well, if birds and bees and fish can get smarter by connecting groups together. Um, and allowing them to work together in systems, maybe we can use AI to allow humans to do that. And uh, and so we, you know, back in 2014, we started uh, doing our, our, our initial tests of connecting groups of people together in swarms. They could be, you know, over the internet, they could be anywhere in the world. And it turns out that when we do that, groups make smarter decisions, better decisions, more accurate decisions, and they, they still can leverage their, you know, human values and morals. And, and so, uh, and, and David is going to you know, give us uh, give a, a demonstration and talk more about it and let people try Swarm. But uh, this this technology that we created uh, that we call um, Swarm AI is basically a, a method that uh, uses AI not to replace people, but to connect people and turn groups of people into super experts. Super experts that can make uh, you know significantly more accurate decisions and forecasts and predictions. And so it's just, just as an example, we did a study with MIT. We had groups of financial analysts uh, and not, not huge groups. It was you know, 15 analysts. They could be anywhere in the world. They connect together and swarm. And we asked them to predict the price of gold, price of oil and the S&P 500. Uh, asked them to do it alone. 
as individuals, ask them to do it as a, as a group by just taking a vote, which is you know, a typical way of doing it, or we ask them to work together in this, as a system, as a swarm using our software. And when they work together as a swarm, uh, they were over 25% more accurate in forecasting, in generating forecasts. Um, and uh, we published papers with MIT about it. We did, we did studies with Oxford University using sports fans to predict uh, English English Premier uh, soccer. Uh, we have did a just did a, a large study with Stanford Medical School with small groups of doctors making um, diagnoses using Swarm. And when they used Swarm, they reduced their diagnostic errors by over thirty percent when they worked together as a Swarm. Uh, and now we have businesses using using Swarm to make sales forecasts, business uh, business decisions, um, predict inventory, uh, and they can amplify their intelligence. And and even the United the United Nations has been uh, using Swarm to predict famines around the world. And so, yeah. So uh, that's uh, probably a good segue to, to what it, it it is. And just for the fun fun part of it, and I'm I'm glad you are not a gambler. Because the, the uh, Wall Street Journal article also referenced uh, some of the successes, whether in uh, predicting the four horses that would win in the Kentucky or the top four in the Kentucky Derby yeah. or the Golden State Warriors winning in six games. So this swarm intelligence, even though initially I was thinking, how is it different than a group of people sitting together and having a conversation or people rank ordering? but it obviously is different and produces outstanding uh, outcomes with, with a much higher probability of the group getting the right answers. Yeah, I mean, what, what we learned from nature is that um, the, what nature doesn't do is they don't just you know, take a vote, uh, they, don't, they don't take a survey, they don't take a poll. Uh, <laughs> they form these systems where the groups can push and pull on each other and discover together the best answer. And, uh, and the way our technology works is it, it's, we, uh, you know, questions appear on the screen and David's gonna show this and, and everybody uh, can interact uh, with their mouse or their touch screen or a tablet. But the, the key is that we're getting everybody to behave. They're all interacting together and the AI is watching how everybody's behaving and is able to determine their relative levels of confidence and conviction. And, um, and it guides the system. And as the system moves, people's confidence changes and the AI can see how people are changing their behaviors. And so it, it really, the AI is evoking from the people uh, their different levels of, of, of confidence in the answers. And, and that's, completely missing from a survey, right? In a survey, I could have a, a, a thousand people give me an answer and I have no idea which people were just guessing and which people really know the answer, right? Uh, in Swarm, the AI can, can determine that by how the people are behaving, who, you know, who's confident and who's, um, who's ambivalent and it guides the system and we get these answers that are just, are much more accurate. And again, that's how birds and bees and fish do it uh, amplifying their intelligence. And so it, you know, evolution works. <laughs> Outstanding. So we're really excited. Uh, Lewis is out in California. David uh, Baltax, who is his president of Unanimous AI, is right here in Arlington, Virginia. David is going to take us through, uh, I think, five or so swarms and um, I will share my screen for those of you that can't participate. All it means, though, you are going to click a link so, you, uh, so anonymously you can participate in the swarm. And then we come back and do a uh, brief debrief of the swarm. So, David, we are really happy to have you tell us uh, what we need to do in order to participate in a couple of these uh, swarms. Okay, thank you very much, and and uh, really fascinating discussion. Great, great to hear the 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 the, the all the different topics that were, were covered. Um, yeah, so uh, I am happy to be with you. Um, I am going to lead us through a, a real world use of the Swarm platform, so that everyone can get a, a sense of what it feels like to be part of this uh, system that Lewis was talking about. I've posted into chat 
a link. It looks like a, a number of people have already um, uh, found that link and have started clicking on it. But if you go into, into chat, you'll see that there is a link there. Um, to... As you're speaking, David, by the way, I will share my screen for those that can't go in. They can see it. However, I would encourage people to click the link and go use it as well. Yeah, thank you. We'd much prefer to have you participate in Swarm because as Lewis said, what we're really going to do here is we're going to create a real system, a system that includes all of you as participants uh, in real time. So um, if you put your mouse pointer next to that glass puck, you will see that your mouse pointer turns into a magnet. Your magnet is green and everybody else's magnet is gold. Now your, your magnet, as well as everybody else, is, is pulling on that glass puck. It's, it's exerting a little bit of a force on that glass puck. And you can see that there, you'll see a little bit of animation. Your magnet is closer, is strongest when it's closest to the puck. You can see that because it's actually larger. Um, and it gets, uh, you'll see it gets smaller as you move it away. That signifies that you're having less influence, less pull on the puck. So what's gonna happen is I'm going to post some questions uh, and everyone will see them uh, at the same time. And we will work together to bring the puck to one an answer, which you'll see some answers distributed on the screen. Um, we'll work together to bring the puck to the answer that we feel is the best possible answer that we could bring it to. So we need to work together to bring the puck to an answer that is the best choice for, uh, for us as a group. You don't have to click, you don't have to swipe, just keep repositioning your magnet and keep in mind that uh, the closer your magnet is to the puck, the stronger your pull. You'll wanna pull continuously with your magnet during each answer. If you're not pulling on the puck with your magnet, you have no impact on the outcome. Again, our goal is to converge on the best possible answer for each question by combining our collective knowledge, insights, and intuition. So let's, let's uh, start with uh, a very simple question and let's just make sure that everybody is comfortable with how to use it. Um, you'll see the question here at the top of the screen. What's the most important invention of the 20th century? Set your magnet now during the three, two, one countdown, and let's work together to bring the puck to the answer that we think is most appropriate. So be open to compromise, but let's see if we can bring it to a choice. And we just wanna center it over that node, center it over that light, and hold it there for a couple of seconds, and you'll see it registers. You'll also note on that scoreboard there, there's a conviction score. You can see it shows us in this case, 68%. Um, that indicates, to, uh, the, as Lewis was talking about, that is an indication of how well aligned the group was. How, what is the group's overall conviction in the answer that we just selected? So 68% is fairly in the middle, and that's pretty much appropriate for uh, our first choice, our, our first ch try at Swarm. But you'll also keep in mind that there was a significant number of people pulling for other choices. We could see groups of people pulling uh, there for personal computers, for instance. But I think everybody has got a pretty good idea of, uh, of how this, this will work. So let's, um, let's begin with some questions that, so Mahan and I worked together beforehand to put together a set of questions that we thought would be interesting and pertinent to this group. So let's, um, let's begin with some questions that are pertinent to residents of the District of Columbia. And I will put the first one here on the screen in a way just as an easy way for us to read it. And this question is, What's the most that I will put up on the screen in just a minute is what's the most effective thing that the District of Columbia could do over the next two years to increase the supply of affordable housing for middle income residents. So we can see that on the screen. Take a, please take a moment to read through those uh, answer choices. And now I'm gonna post the question in Swarm 
And let's work together, please, to find the answer that we think is the best answer to the, the best answer that we can come up with. Excellent. You see here, we had a slightly higher conviction. Now we're at 76%. Now, it's important for everybody to know, as, as uh, Mahan had mentioned earlier, a concern about people being, um, that their voice not being heard, that their information not being um, collected. You should know that <clears throat> everybody's information, everybody's um, uh, data as it is um, being contributed by the position of your magnet is being recorded. And I'll show you um, in a few minutes, I'll show you the back end so you can see some of the data uh, as well um, and how it's collected. But, but do keep in mind that even though um, you, you know, the, the swarm may not wind up with your top choice, your information, um, the choices that you were supporting, even as you considered other choices, um, we're all um, uh, we're, we're all collected uh, throughout. So let's take a look at another question now. Over the next two years, which of these uh, innovative approaches, which you can see bulleted below, would be the most effective for the District of Columbia to efficiently design and construct low-cost housing for individuals with limited incomes? So take a moment now to read through those options. And let's think about which of these do we think collectively would be most effective over the next two years. Excellent. We'll have a question. Actually, we have uh, another question a little later on in the uh, in the series here for us to be to th to think about actually on that question. Um, so I'm just watching the clock here. Um, let's take a, actually let's jump right to that question right now and uh, on that topic and let's actually consider some vacancy rates uh, in the DC area. So this is a chart, as you can see on the screen, let me double check that everyone can see it. Yep. Um, this is a chart from, uh, uh, from uh, the DC Policy Center. Um, and as you can see, although it shows vacancy rates, uh, each column here is January 2021, January 2022, and January 2023 for a variety of metropolitan areas, but the dark green one um, just up from uh, four up from the bottom is the, the uh, greater uh, Washington DC metro area. Um, the office vacancy in January, 2021, as you can see was 18%. In January, 2022 was 24%. And in 2023, January, 2023 was 46%. So the question we wanna consider is, what will the office vacancy rate be in January 2024? Now we're going to do this. Uh, we're going to consider this question. Give it a, a moment of thought. Um, what will be the office vacancy rate in January 2024? And we're going to start by trying to identify a range, a percent range. So again, uh, it was. It was 24% January 2022, 46% in January 2023. Where do we think it will be in January 2024? So once we've identified first a range, now let's zoom in on that range. Let's see if we can get more precise in our answer. 
And you'll see now we have answers in 5% increments around the hexagon from 40% to 66%. Where do we think it will be in a year? question's a lot more divisive, um, but we do only have about 20 seconds left. Let's see if we can bring it to a compromise point, if there is one to be had. Excellent. And again, I do want to just mention that uh, even though we have, um, uh, even, even in cases where the group is unable to fully reach a uh, complete answer um, uh, or come to an answer, a consensus answer using SWARM, um, all of that data is collected, is available. So when we do look uh, uh, to, at the results on our back end and our analytics, None of that is lost. We're able to actually get a sense of how contentious the issue was. What were the other choices that people were considering? Um, we can run through, I think we have a, a few minutes that we could um, run through. Uh, Mahana, if we, are we going to do some questions and answers as, uh, afterwards, some open Q&A? I, I, would, I would love to uh, be able to do that, David. So I know there is the back end of where people were pulling and where the like the heat map. Yes, yes. It would be helpful because understanding the outcome is great, but understanding, as you mentioned, how contentious the issue was and where people were pulling is also helpful to understand how this works. Okay. So I think, Mahan, rather than continue to go through questions, I think everybody seems to have a pretty good idea of, of how to use the system. Um, then if people return their attention, you can close out of Swarm and return your attention to, um, uh, to, the, um, to the Zoom platform. And I as, you, as you're showing that, David, there is a question I want to pose to you to answer also, is that, is it unusual that we got to our answers so quickly? So it's a, that is a, a fascinating question. Um, I will say, no, it is not unusual. What, what you find is that when you work with Swarm, the fact that um, it is a fully interactive environment, that you people will stake their positions, but will also be, um, uh, be able to see how everybody else is feeling in real time and being able to respond. Essentially what happens is everyone starts with their top of mind position, just like you would have in a survey. But in a survey, you're stating that position or you're, you know, you may be just racing through your survey and just checking boxes as you go. Um, but if you're being thoughtful about it, you've approached it and provided your first position, but you've done so in isolation. You've done so without consideration or contemplation of, of how other people are feeling and what the most, um, uh, the best choice is for the group. What is the group's optimal choice? The Swarm AI is helping the group identify and, and arrive at, converge on the best choice for the group. It's doing so by understanding how much conviction people have in each of their choices. Now, what we found is we give 60 seconds, we bound each question for 60 seconds to encourage the group to really go through that process of stating their position, seeing how everybody else is, is responding, reacting. If they feel it's appropriate, they might change their position. They may move to their secondary, depending on what their individual levels of conviction are. And they arrive together at, uh, um, at, a, um, you know, at a, a group consensus, at a group decision. The vast majority of questions asked in Swarm, regardless of topic, are almost always arrived at within 60 seconds. 
In fact, most of them are even arrived at around the 30 second mark. And David, as, as you show us that, uh, does the size of group matter? That's another question. And I would love for us, we have like uh, seven or eight minutes before top of the hour to see the back end of it. Does the size of group make a difference? So we, we strongly recommend not to have fewer than five um, for a, uh, a valid swarm or a really a, a, um, a, a, a fully appropriate swarm session. Um, if you have fewer than five people, you probably don't, <clears throat> don't need something quite as sophisticated as swarm anyway, as a swarm AI process. There is no technical limit um, uh, to the uh, number of people who can participate in a swarm session. We've run swarms with hundreds of people. Uh, when we're doing general, when we do research work, general population, things like that, we usually actually find that the uh, sweet spot is around 50 people, 50 to 60 people, um, because we are actually much more efficient at gathering data than uh, traditional uh, survey tools and things, uh, things like that. Um, so we really actually are able to use a much smaller sample size than you might need with a, uh, that you might require with a survey or other kind of quantitative research. So um, do, you, do you mind then showing that back end also? We've got about six minutes to top of the hour. No, we'll do that right now. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. All right. Can, Mahan, can you confirm yes. that? You can, okay, great. Yes. So what we're looking at right now actually is, are, is what we call Swarm Insights, uh, just a part of um, the Swarm platform that uh, shows where uh, and uh, all of the information related to uh, uh, the question that was asked. So in this question, uh, which of these would be the most effective of the next two years, we can actually watch the replay it's a little bit sped up here, but you can actually see the replay of our swarm working together as they came through this. Now, all of these uh, replays are also hosted on their own URL. They can be downloaded, all of these charts and all of the, these can be um, uh, downloaded so that you can watch them and share them with other people. We have a variety of different types of visualizations that can be used to, to express um, what is happening here in Swarm. Um, here on the right, uh, as you talked about, you referred to it as the heat map. Um, we have the support density chart, which is a really a 2D representation of what happened here in Swarm. And we can actually see very quickly that there was support really for primarily three different choices. Um, and we can see where that progress went. We have a variety of other charts and uh, out of the box that allow us to consider how that changed over time. And so we can actually see that, um, you know, some things like uh, what was dark blue streamlining zoning and permitting had uh, soft as well as, as yellow, the use of public land for affordable housing. The support for that changed over time as the group consolidated around these other uh, options. And we have a variety of other um, types of, uh, uh, of analytics. They can all be further divided. We have full uh, methods of being able to identify cohorts. Perhaps, as you pointed out, we might want to look at how Democrats and Republicans feel about an issue. It allows us to see where they differ, but also how they, uh, where, where they have the greatest similarities, where the greatest uh, interest uh, is in, uh, in common issues. We also have, this is the, um, uh, in fact, actually, let me open up one other question. It'd be easier to show. Um, this is the final question of the quantitative one we asked about where we think that the office vacancy will be. And you can see that um, one of the things that I wanna point out here is you can see on the heat density uh, the support density chart, actually, this little X, this little circle X, which is a little off of the 50%. What, this, what Swarm will do is it will calculate, particularly for quantitative or any kind of continuous variable, 
but any kind of quantitative question, what the optimal answer would have been for this group. We had people pulling for 45%. We had people pulling for 55%. We had people pulling um, for lots of different choices. They converged on 50%, but the optimal answer we can see here was probably, and, and we'll do the math a little later, is probably around 51, 52%. We'll see in January how how uh, how well our group did uh, in that forecast. Outstanding, outstanding. So we will we will send a, uh, a, a link to Swarm AI uh, to the participants as well to check it out. Uh, Danny put put a link in the chat for uh, Survey Monkey response, so you can also give us a response on this uh, conversation. Uh, David and Lewis really appreciate uh, both you joining this conversation. As I mentioned, we can have conversations for hours. David, you're in town so we can see you at our LGW events. We are a huggy group. So when I see you, I will give you a big <laughs> hug in real life, not, not virtual reality or augmented reality. Lewis, we look forward to also seeing you in the greater Washington, D.C. region with the leaders of greater Washington, D.C., because one of the great things about LGW and our leaders is we truly want to use the power of AI the way you talk about it, Lewis, for the betterment of humanity, mindful of all the potential complications and biases that can go into it. So thank you so much for joining Leadership Greater Washington, Lewis and David. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us. You are, you are most welcome. I look forward to, to seeing you at future events. Absolutely. Thank you all for joining. Edwin, great seeing you as well. So look forward to seeing you in our next uh, LGW conversation or in-person event. Have a great day. Thank you.